good morning everyone thank you for being here we appreciate you joining us for today's session on sustainable agriculture for livelihoods promotion in the northeastern region of india this session is hosted by nera mac with support from the from center for responsible business let me now introduce commodore rajiv ashok without further delay to begin today's proceedings i would like to start with introducing commodore rajiv ashok Commodore Rajiv Ashok is a second generation military officer and retired after 31 years of service post premature retirement uh, he assumed charge as managing director northeastern uh, regional agricultural marketing corporation naramac at naramac he has actively worked towards rural community development through effective implementation of the 10000 formation and promotion of fpo central sector scheme of the ministry of agriculture farmers and welfare and skilling programs of various ministries Over to you, Commodore Shok, to provide the introductory remarks. With that, I would like to invite Commodore. Thank you very much. <coughs> Shri Chanchal Kumar, Secretary, Ministry of Development of Northeastern Region. Shri Anshuman Day, Joint Secretary, Ministry of Donor and Secretary NEC. Senior officers from ministries of Government of India, fellow panelists, professionals, scholars, subject matter experts in the audience, friends from the media, ladies and gentlemen. a very good morning to all of you on behalf of the ministry of development of northeastern region it is my pleasure to warmly welcome you all to today's seminar on sustainable agriculture for livelihoods promotion in the northeastern region we are very excited to see such a diverse and enthusiastic gathering and hope that this session lives up to your expectations we would like to extend i would like to extend my gratitude to the center of responsible business who has partnered with us in meramac to jointly work under the banner of ministry of donor to stitch this session together rajit sen gupta and his team has been most forthcoming and have actively worked towards making this session meaningful my gratitude to secretary donor for accepting to be the keynote speaker and the distinguished fellow panelists for agreeing to share the stage we are looking at this session to be highly interactive and your contributions as the audience would undoubtedly enrich discussions and provide valuable perspectives as mentioned the theme of today's session is to discuss various perspectives for livelihood generation in a sustainable agriculture paradigm i am certain that we all agree that generating livelihood not just in the northeast region but also the entire country has been the focus of attention of all ministries and agencies of the government of india the northeastern region with its climatic conditions is abundant in natural resources However there are challenges in enabling sustainable use of these resources. Also the opportunities it provides are many including scope for higher levels of adoption adoption of sustainable agriculture given that the region has the potential to increase its farm income and enhance its food and nutrition security. Secondly given that the population is predominantly agrarian economy dependent it is pertinent to make agriculture economically and ecologically sustainable. thirdly it is the remoteness of farmlands first mile connectivity challenges of logistics and infrastructure facilities and finally limited investments thus far in processing and in situ value additions having spent a few years in the ecosystem i see that there is a growing interest among stakeholders in exploring the ner agriculture value chain a large number of agencies have started to increasingly en enquire and engage with us for information related to sustainable parameters in supply value chain of agri commodities and how they could contribute large scale events such as these help showcase how agriculture value chain could advance sustainable development with a large number of clusters having been created through government of india schemes access to farmers has been enabled as has their access to capacity development and market linkages based on the experience of naramac i can say that towards supporting sustainable livelihoods attention is needed in adoption of good contemporary agriculture practices food processing women who are already a large part of the farming force in ner should be further encouraged and considering the uniqueness of products of produce branding could be worked upon the various schemes of the government have been structured towards shaping and harnessing exactly these aspects i am certain i speak for all of us in the government when i say that we appreciate that schemes can be sustained and made to realize their potential only with corporate and private partnerships today's seminar looks at these aspects 
and some more in detail. We have with us today as the moderator for the session, Rijit Sengupta, the CEO of the Center for Responsible Business. The panelists, Shianshuman Day, Joint Secretary in the Ministry of Development of Northeast Region, and also Secretary NEC Council, NEC uh, Shillong. Ale Bara, the Executive Director of Innovative Change Collaboration, a not-for-profit organization. Dipanvita Chakravarti, Regional Director, Corporate Responsibility and Sustainable Development for the Asia-Pacific Region in Kargil. All have been chosen for diverse perspectives. Before we begin, I would also like to once again thank CRB and the panelists for joining hands with Naramak and all you wonderful audience for joining us this bright morning. Thank you very much. Jahan. Uh, thank you, Commodore Ashok, for setting the context. Now I would like to introduce Sri Chanchal Kamal, who will provide the keynote address for today. Before I give the stage to Sir, I would like to briefly introduce him. Sri Chanchal Kumar is a 1992 IAS batch Bihar cadre officer. He is secretary at the Ministry of Development of Northeastern Region, Government of India. He has previously worked in Government of India in the Ministry of Railways and Ministry of Commerce and Industry. Before joining the Ministry of Development of Northeastern Region, he was managing director, National Highways and Infrastructure. Development Corporation Limited, Government of India. Thank you, Sri Chanchal Kumar, and I li I'd like to please invite you to the stage to provide the key keynote address. Good morning. Dignitaries on the dais, ladies and gentlemen. As you know, today is the topic of sustainable agriculture for livelihood uh, promotion in the Northeast region. This is very topical. When we talk about Northeastern region, so many things come to our mind. But you must realize that there are many challenges and many opportunities that we need to see and we need to see how that potential can be leveraged. Before that, I thank the organizers of the World Food India 2024. This is the third edition of the World Food India. I wish it continued success. Before I tell you more, let me tell you something about some facts about the Northeastern region. It has less than 4% of the population, around 8% of the area, 65% of the area has been designated, has been classified as forest. The growth rate of Northeastern region is more than the average growth rate of the country. Whether you take it at constant prices for the last 10 years, you will find that the investment that is going in the form of public investment is more, and consequently, the growth rate is better. One of the job of the ministry is to ensure that 10% of the gross budgetary support of the 54 non-exempt ministries, it goes in northeastern region. So we see how much of money every ministry is spending. Minimum 10% of the budget this would spend in NER region. The expenditure in the year 2014 was something around 24.5 thousand crore. If you see the last year's picture, this figure was 1,2749 crore. So more than four times the capacity has increased, capacity to execute projects, because ultimately these are the states which execute these projects. Appetite has increased, the implementing capacity has increased. So that shows us that there is good potential to up our efforts, our activities in northeastern region. 70% of the population in NER, they are dependent on livelihood support in the primary sector only. What are the, the strengths of Northeastern region? Abundant water, fertile land and favorable climate, high quality of agriculture. If you know something about Lekadong, turmeric and Meghale, the curcumin value that it has is almost four times the normal value. And I was just talking to one of my colleagues and panelists. They said that if you plant the same variety in some other region, it will not be the same value. So it has something to do with the atmosphere, the geography of that area. The positioning of that northeastern area for organic farming. You know Sikkim is 
organic state and there is a potential for all the states to follow suit. High potential for GI products. There are some very good products that you can see there for medicinal plants, tea, rubber, fruits. And the presence of good market in the neighboring countries, it says that we can export much of our product there. So if you invest in Northeast, if you make it a sustainable livelihood uh, business, then you have a good market so that backward and forward linkages can be established. Although today there are weak market linkages. And what are the challenges? The high cost of production because of difficult and challenging terrain, a sparse population, half the population density of the country. As I said, 4% population, 8% area. So it's half. Then there are problems because you do not have post-harvest facilities. You do not have adequate number of cold storages or processing, primary processing facilities. And region is prone to natural disasters. So these are some of the challenges which we have to mitigate, which we have to navigate through. Government of India has taken up many projects, many schemes. So different ministries are already taking up many schemes. I'll mention some of the uh, schemes. National Mission on Sustainable Agriculture, in which rain-fed area development program is also there. That can be of helpful. Pradhan Mantri Krisi Sachai Yojana, micro irrigation fund that has been created with assistance from NABAD, Digital Agriculture Mission and E-National Agriculture Market, e -NAM. It has allowed farmers to have better discovery of prices in the market. Income support through PM Kisan Yojana. Then in fisheries sector, you have fisheries infrastructure development fund. Pradhan Mantri Matasa Sampada Yojana, which is aimed at strengthening fisheries infrastructure, enable technology infusion, and promote optimal water management. Then you have government is implementing the crop diversification program CDP under the Rastri Kisi Vikas Yojana. Similarly, you have Pradhan Mantri Kisan Sampada Yojana, which is also introducing credit linked financial assistance to build efficient supply chain management. And then there's a program in which 10,000 farmer producer orga organization is to be assisted and it is to be done. Neramac is already managing over 200 FPOs in the NER region. So what is the way forward? I know you will deliberate and you will come up with some recommendations, some suggestions. Let me just point out some of the issues in front of you. One, as I said, if you introduce organic farming, it improves soil health, reduces dependency on chemical and synthetic fertilizers, and opens up market for high value organic products. We need to strengthen the entire agriculture value chain in northeastern region. We need to improve market access for these farmers and FPOs. We need to create more post-harvest uh, post facilities processing units. Sustainable water management in that area is a must because with rainwater harvesting and water set development, we can optimize the use of water resources. We need to secure improvements in crop yields and ensuring income stability. Agroforestry and diversified cropping is something that we can look at. This will optimize the soil health and also give you enough returns. The scheme for organizing farmers into FPOs, it is very beneficial because it gives access to small farmers a common facility center. So the strength of a group goes to an individual. And that is something which you can leverage on. We need to promote startups and MSME in agriculture sector. We have an organization called NEDFI, Northeastern Development Finance Corporation. They have been helping entrepreneurs and startup companies in Northeast. And if you see, some of them have come up so well, so well. So ideas are not to be generated only in other areas, foreign countries. You have so many good ideas that come up from these young boys, young generation people. We need to involve this youth and women. If we empower youth and women, we make agriculture an attractive proposition. Let me be very frank with you. When I talk to many of these young generation people, they say that this has become slightly unattractive profession. If people have 
good degrees good education they would like to go out and do something else other than agriculture we need to combine the traditional knowledge of these people with modern agricultural practices that is how you make it sustainable that is how you involve people use of indigenous knowledge is a must when we talk about sustainability and particularly in view of the fact that there are many varieties many issues many problems of north eastern region which cannot be 100% mitigated or managed by modern agricultural practices which you have in other parts of the country solution of the north eastern region must involve or include the traditional knowledge of agriculture there traditional knowledge regarding crop varieties soil management pest control all these things have to be integrated into modern agriculture practices then only we can make it sustainable otherwise in terms of agriculture yes you will find corporate farming it's going on on a large scale monoculture of one plantation in thousands of acres but that is not sustainable so sustainability means that you have to see the see and weigh the convenience and inconvenience because of introduction of a particular technology a variety as was pointed out we have seen that the crs uh, csr funding in northeast is small compared to what its potential is last when we were talking in a meeting we found that less than 2% of the total corporate social responsibility fund it goes to northeastern region this needs to be increased we are in touch with ministry of corporate affairs we are in touch with industry bodies industry association how we can have good investable projects in agriculture sector in livelihood sector and we can ask private sector people also to chip in to come and invest there so discussion you will be taking but uh, if we have to continue this journey towards a sustainable agriculture this will require collaboration of all stakeholders scientists farmers <coughs> government private sector for better investment let us work together to see that this potential of the north eastern region this is utilized optimally sustainably because what we do today is the legacy that will leave for the future generations let us not introduce something today in our practices in our technology which is of which is not properly thought through which can be good in the short term but it has negative impacts consequences in the long term so that is something which you must see because you know this area is so challenging we keep on hearing about so much of landslide so much of issues regarding soil stabilization flood management of extra water excess water so many issues are there this is a evolving area people are going its tourist potential has increased so much that large number of people are not trying to go there so we have to develop this area in a sustainable way we have to see that people of that area they live in that area adopt sustainable practices and add to the economy of the region i'm very hopeful that the deliberation today will be very useful for us i'll request my officials of my ministry also to note down the suggestions and if we can talk to stakeholders essentially the state government and other and other line ministries and see how some of these suggestions can be implemented in short span of time i wish you success thank you uh, thank you shri chanchal kumar for making the keynote address i would like to request commodore shok to join us on the stage to conduct the felicitation of shri chanchal kumar
thank you uh, moving on to the next agenda, uh, item on the agenda today i would re like to request uh, i would like to request uh, shri chanchal kumar to come back on stage for a, a, a group one more group photograph with the before the upcoming panel discussion Thank you. I would like to uh, now introduce the moderator of today's panel discussion. Rijit Sen Gupta is CEO of, this, of Center for Responsible Business and has over 20 years of experience in various areas of sustainable development policy and practice across Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa. He, his interest lies in the interface of business and, and society, particularly environment protection, management, consumer welfare, community welfare, livelihoods, SMEs, business regulation, responsible business and SDGs. Thank, yeah, yeah. Thank you for time, your time today in moderating this panel discussion and over to you, Rijit. Thank you, Nitya, for that uh, generous introduction. And uh, thank you, uh, Secretary Sir, for, uh, uh, for, for the extremely enriching opening address. Um, at the outset, uh, we are very grateful to the Department of uh, Development of the Northeast, the Ministry of uh, Development of the Northeast, or a donor, for giving us this opportunity, and in particular, uh, Commodore Ashok and, uh, and Naramak for, um, for giving us this opportunity to engage on this topic of extremely uh, keen interest for the Center for Responsible Business. We work on sustainability issues across a various sectors and uh, agriculture, uh, sustainable and inclusive agriculture is one of them. As you have already heard from uh, the, the Honorable Secretary and of course uh, in the opening remarks of uh, Commander Ashok, this, the, the, the topic is extremely relevant and extremely, um, extremely contemporary, of contemporary interest. Um, we often talk about the Northeast uh, in various discussions that we've been involved with on the challenges, on the problems. But I would like to, um, like to request that, you know, on, on the Saturday morning, bright Saturday morning, as, uh, as uh, Commander Ashok mentioned, and as uh, Secretary Sir has already highlighted, let us focus on the opportunities uh, of the Northeast and how can we take those opportunities forward and create some sort of a forward-looking agenda. It is extremely, it is great to see it. so many people show up in Delhi at 10 o'clock for a 10 o'clock session. This is not, uh, uh, you know, this is not generally normal, but also highlights that all of you have interest on the topic and interest to do something for the region. Some of us might not be from the region, but we feel very deeply about this region because of some reasons and we want to contribute. So let us start and think about some action-oriented, specific issues that can come out from this discussion today and we can take that together, as uh, Secretary Sir said, collaboratively. You know, and, and what better way to reflect that in the panel? We have an eclectic panel here today and you can see that we've got people extremely erudite and very experienced uh, speakers working in the region, working on the subject. So what better uh, can we, what better setup can we have? So thank you to all the panelists for your time here today. <clears throat> Before we start with the discussion, the way we'd like to conduct this is that, you know, it'll be sort of a conversational mode. There are no presentations, etc. We are going to have a, have a dialogue uh, with, with our fellow pa uh, panelists. Um, but before we start, let us also 
maybe highlight and reiterate some of the data that already Commodore, Asho uh, Commodore Ashok and uh, Sri Chanchal Kumar ji has mentioned. I will try to say a little English and Hindi mila ke bolu, if that is okay. Uh, I think it might be better. <coughs> so, what I have said is, and please forgive me, I am a Bengali trying to speak in Hindi, huh? so not the best articulation, so please forgive me at the outset. So, what I have said already is that this region is specifically agriculture, forestry, if you will see, in the rest हम 30 percent forest एक हमारा agenda रहा है पिछले कई दशकों से वो हम struggle कर रहे हैं अभी ये region है जहाँ पे लगभग 64 percent forest cover है 43 percent of the plant species and 47 percent of the food crop species of India occur in this region तो इसका जो natural resource base है वो सबको पता है just giving some data अगर हम देखेंगे livelihoods के बारे में sustainable livelihoods is a topic depending on कौन से state के लोगों के साथ आप बात करते हैं depending on that anything between 67 percent to 81 percent of the population is is connected directly to the agriculture sector मतलब livelihoods directly agriculture से आता है in state में और अगर हम agriculture की ही बात करें जैसे smallholders की बात सर ने बताया है स्मॉल होल्डर्स की अगर बात करें तो स्मॉल होल्डर्स का कलेक्टिवाइजेशन थ्रू फार्मर प्रोड्यूसर ऑर्गेनाइजेशन एंड नेनामैक हैज बीन एट द फोर फ्रंट देयर आर क्लोज टू 1400 बेस्ड ऑन द डेटा दैट वी हैव सीन क्लोज टू अबाउट 1400 एफपीओस इन द इसका मतलब कि एक साउंड बेस है नेचुरल रिसोर्स भी बड़ा स्ट्रांग है लाइवलीहुड के साथ एकदम डायरेक्ट कनेक्शन है लोगों का और जो कलेक्टिवाइजेशन और इंस्टीट्यूशनलाइजेशन भी बहुत स्ट्रॉंग है इन एडिशन टू दैट गाम डिपार्टमेंट दी डी मिनिस्ट्री ऑफ़ द डेवलपमेंट ऑफ़ द नॉर्थ ईस्ट रीजन हैज बीन प्रोमोटिंग एंड ट्राइंग टू ड्राइव दिस दिस रीजन थ्रू एग्रीकल्चर एंड लाइवलीहुड्स एंड वेरिय and in taking it forward, two three areas are in which, and I'm very glad that uh, that uh, Chanchal Kumar ji brought up the issue of private sector engagement. CSR is an indicator. अगर आप देखेंगे, अगर आप बात करेंगे और हम बात करते हैं काफी काफी सारे private sector के लोगों के साथ, because that is our work, Center for Responsible Business का वही काम है to see how private sector can drive sustainable, uh, you know, outcomes. तो उसमें हम जिन के साथ भी बात करते हैं वो लगता है कि यू नो द डी एंगेजमेंट ऑफ़ द बिजनेस एंड द प्राइवेट सेक्टर ऑफ़ प्रोक्योरिंग एग्रीकल्चर और बीइंग इन्वॉल्ड इन द एग्रीकल्चर सेक्टर वो उतन वहाँ तक नहीं है जहाँ तक होना चाहिए सो आज का जो विषय है और जो डिस्कशन है इसमें हम विशेष रूप से इस पर ध्यान दें कि जो प्राइवेट सेक्टर और जो बिजनेस है उसको किस तरीके से एफ के द्वारा एग्रीकल्चर सेक्टर में जोड़ा जाए एंड हाउ डू वी डेवलप एक नीव रचा जाए फॉर सस्टेनेबल एंड इंक्लूसिव एग्रीकल्चर इन द रीजन भले ही हम सात आठ जो स्टेट से सबकी बात नहीं कर पाए परंतु हम कुछ सेक्टर्स और कुछ स्टेट्स की बात जरूर कर पाएंगे और और उसी के आधार पे हम आगे का जो पैनल है उसको आगे ले जाएंगे तो मैं शुरू करना चाहूँगा श्री अंशुमान दे जी के साथ जो जॉइंट सेक्रेटरी हैं मिनिस्ट्री ऑफ डोनर में और सर थैंक यू सो मच फॉर जॉइनिंग अस हियर टुडे बिफोर आई आस्क यू यू नो सम पॉइंटर्स और सम क्वेश्चंस और और यू नो योर योर थॉट्स गिव मी द ऑनर ऑफ इंट्रोड्यूसिंग यू सो Shri Angshman De is an Indian IFS officer of 1997 batch of Tripura Kadar and he's been in the working, uh, holding the position of the Joint Secretary of the Donor Ministry. In addition to that, he's also holding the a very important position of the, uh, the Secretary of the Northeastern Council. And, um, and he has been uh, working on various issues related, to which are very critical and related to the, to the subject, water resources, forestry, agriculture, allied sector, and so on and so forth. So 
थैंक यू वंस अगेन अंशुमान जी आप आप आए और यू ज्वाइन द पैनल टुडे एंड आपसे हम जानना चाहेंगे जो यू नो द मिनिस्ट्री ऑफ डोनर हैज बीन एट द फोर फ्रंट ऑन पॉलिसीज एंड एंड पॉलिसी इनोवेशंस सो दो चीज़ों पे अगर आप थोड़ा सा यू यू कैन प्रोवाइड योर थॉट्स ऑन टू इशूज वन इज यू नो वॉट आर सम ऑफ दी innovative policy interventions or policy innovations that are happening right now in this area of agriculture uh, at the at the at the ministry and secondly what are your thoughts on how can we start uh, better engaging businesses kis tarike se business ko hum is sector mein aur is region mein achhi tarike se involve kar paaye you will have about 7 minutes if that's okay all right thanks very good morning to all of you respected secretary donor chanchal kumar sir distinguished panelist and uh, distinguished uh, participants ladies and gentlemen a very very pertinent topic that we will be discussing today sustainable agriculture for li livelihood promotion in northeastern region with specific reference to the two points that have been uh, Post to me that is policy innovation and how we can engage with the business in a better better way. Now the sustainable agriculture has many meaning to many people. If as an academician we talk about sustainable agriculture, we primarily mean a conservation agriculture. But if uh, as a general approach to sustainable agriculture we talk about, then the usual question of sustainability that we know that quadrangle. Na? that uh, it should be economically viable it should be environmentally sound it should be technically feasible and socially acceptable those four uh, filters we apply to any kind of intervention so with agriculture so i take that as a definition of sustainable agriculture because if we talk about only conservation agriculture i don't think we have many uh, elbows elbow space to this thing very briefly i'll talk about two three anecdotes very short anecdotes which gives a state of things that is happening in the agricultural front in the northeastern region i have observed them closely not only as a joint secretary in the ministry looking after the primary livelihood sector but myself come from a background which i have been a part of an agricultural family a small farmer in the northeastern region now i go to a village after 25 years i find that most of the fishermen they were dependent on the local water bodies huge wetlands they used to sell fish all around the village and the nearby towns and all they have suddenly disappeared vanished i don't know where they have gone i asked what happened to this fellow's son he had three sons all the three sons have gone to bangalore they work as a security guard in some mall well, what happened to this uh, agriculture this uh, fish fishing traditional practice but there is no longer viable i mean the uh, the quantum of fish catch has gone drastically down and uh, there are people who do not consider the profession as to be as attractive as they used to be so in the entire northeastern region bearing a sites very few region a tremendous amount of migration taking place from the villages to the not only the tier 2 or tier 3 cities but tier 1 cities where people are going some some people are struggling somewhere putting up somewhere in the slums or maybe catching up that is the usual way things happen and at the same time we talk that this is one of the most naturally endowed nature had bestowed resources on this second example very recently i have visited a few tea gardens in the northeastern region i asked them that what is this condition of your laborers of the tea gardens they have most of the people have gone from jharkhand and places like that some 70 80 years back even some before independence when british established the tea gardens over there i found that only old ladies and men are working in the tea gardens the none of the new generation people are into the processing of tea what happened to that 
again the same question is no longer viable. Why? Because the productivity has gone drastically down. I inquired further deep into it. What is what? Why did it happen? They said probably it is because of climate change. The, the micro conditions of the gardens is, has gone down. Uh, the families settlements have become unsustainable. Same amount of land, more and more people are coming. So people are going doing all kinds of business other than the tea. For third example I talk about is that. Uh, the fish, the first I was, I was talking about. We used to get a local fish. Now the entire market, even in the bank of the water body, which boasted of best fishes catch, they're flooded with fishes from Andhra Pradesh and all. So things from outside is going there. Fourth example, we went in a village in Meghalaya called Molinong. This is the cleanest village in South Asia. They found a lot of people. After education, they didn't have an inclination of going outside. They continued there. In small house, they converted into a homestay. And uh, nowadays, people come and then search for houses. They are booked, overbooked. So they have to refuse many people. So that is the example, counter example, where the migration, the pressure of migration has not worked there. People have found their own way. I was central nodal officer for a district in JNK, Kashmir, Doda, fourth example. There I went to a nursery, a basically an orchard consisting of not only apple but other fruits as well. I found that there's a gentleman who used to work in a forest nursery somewhere. He has set up an orchard and doing pretty good. So the district admission took me there. I asked him that, uh, what are your sons doing next generation? What are they? I mean, the way, what are they doing? So, so they, they, they are working with me in the orchard. I will have your son, well, they have not studied or something? Well, they both are electrical engineers. But <laughs> then I asked him that why they are working here? They could have gone into some good places and earned a lot of money. Well, this farm itself is so lucrative. I earned a lot of money from this. So it can sustain more than two engineer sons. So they continued that. So the Second two example is an antithesis of the first two, three examples I spoke about. So where is the gap? Why is this happening? Somewhere people are migrating and somewhere people are doing the, just the opposite thing. So with this context, I'll talk about three things. Number one, in every challenge, there is an opportunity. So what are the opportunities we can see in, in the face of the challenges? And where are the points in which the value chain investors can enter? I think that was one of the asks from me this morning. Second is very important, how to make this process more inclusive? Because if we exclude certain portion of the society, that the development is going to be not going to be sustainable and there are going to be some kind of social non-acceptability of that. And third thing is how to bring synergy, synergy among various agencies, particularly the academia and bureaucracy, those who are planning, planning and accelerate growth in the agriculture sector. Many of you will be knowing that uh, the ministry along with agriculture ministry has constituted a task force on agriculture, I was very actively associated with that. It came up with a long set of recommendations and which was communicated back to the agriculture ministry and we did, had a lot of discussion with the states also how to go about it. We uh, made some progress, but a lot of things are yet to be done. Now with this, I come to a very pertinent question is, as per policy, the, every ministry of central government was supposed to spend 10% of the uh, budget, budgetary resources in the northeastern region. We call it 10% GBS. We made an analysis and found that the agriculture ministry is the largest ministry which is not in a position to spend this 10% mandatory. We went in, as an agriculture task force, went deeper into it and we found that at least three of the major scheme, which having major allocations for Northeast, they were entitlement based. 
लाइक प्रधानमंत्री फसल बीमा योजना प्रधानमंत्री किसान पीएम किसान वेयर कैश सब्सिडी इज गिवन टू द फार्मर्स देन वी वेंट फर्दर डीप इन टू इट वी फाउंड दैट एग्रीकल्चर मिनिस्ट्री इज एक्चुअली एबल टू स्पेंड इफ यू टेक इन टू कंसिडरेशन एंटाइटलमेंट बेस्ड आउटले ऑल्सो वन फोर्थ ऑफ वॉट एवर दे हैव ए लोकेटेड एवरी ईयर प्रधानमंत्री फसल देर आर देर आर फोर्टीन क्रोर सिक्सटी फाइव लाख फार्मर्स इन दिस कंट्री फोर्टीन लाख सिक्सटी टू फाइव क्रोर दिस फिफ्टीन सिक्सटीन फिगर आफ्टर दैट इट हेज नॉट बीन अपडेटेड आउट ऑफ विच ओनली फोर्टी टू लाख फार्मर्स आर देर इन द नॉर्थ ईस्ट विच इज अबाउट टू पॉइंट नाइन परसेंट so goes well with the normal i mean pr proportion of population about 3% of national population is there but proportion of land is 8% of the total geographical area of the country but if you see the cultivable land operational holdings i think it is 3.3% only geographical area 8% is northeast operational holding only 3.3% and the coverage under pradhan mantri fasal bima yojana in the entire country latest figure is around 9 crore out of this 14.65 crore now as per 10% gbs even pradhan mantri fasal bima yojana is equally applicable to the northeast what should have been the coverage at least it is 10% of 9 crore which is 90 lakh but the total number of farmers in the north east is 42 lakh much less than that so it logical that the entire population of farmers entire number of operational holdings in the north east could have been covered under pradhan mantri fasal bima yojana but what is the actual situation of coverage this morning only i checked checked do you know how much has been the coverage so far pradhan mantri fasal bima yojana it is less than 4000 90 lakh And four thousand. So there is a mismatch somewhere. I asked some people why this is happening. So they said that uh, we are not having enough cross cut, uh, crop cutting experience properly. There are not enough insurance companies ready to go there and work there. The answer is there is technology available. There is AI available. There is satellite imagery available, high resolution, even sub meter accuracy available. the entire character of the crop can be analyzed in the field cloud free data is also available we are sending a satellite also from the ministry of donor and some other minister together that also is possible why this is not happening i think investors prospective investors we had several uh, kind of uh, road shows also at various places either they are simply finding it too risky a business to enter and go there or they are not having enough data or facilitation or support from the state government or from somewhere some authorities this is one area i think in which we both as government department and investors should specifically work to find some solution to this if technology cannot address these issues then what for are this technology are this technology for creating beautiful documents and those things so today we have the government has also formed a industry 4.0 interministerial committee and also an committee on indigenous poultry and uh, fishery these are working on this but uh, i think there is a case of having uh, this people i'll take 2 3 more minutes and then i conclude maybe now certain specific area where we can work is one is setting up of tissue culture laboratory in private sector government sector the success rates of tissue culture lab is lab is not very encouraging so i think this is one area where with the co coordination with state government departments we can set up tissue culture lab not only tissue culture lab but also in certain crops certain species species we require a high amount of quality planting material certified planting stocks there also i think uh, private investment can be there uh, private investment need not go and set up a unit there they can pick up the local partners 
who are more conversant with the local dynamics and local demographics, they can help there. Second thing is the area about processing infrastructure. Now, we have a very high requirement of primary processing unit, drying and multi-crop and other at the farm gate level. That's not happening because the farmers are not in a position to do that on their own. It requires some kind of hand-holding support from outside and uh, then forward linkage to some kind of market assured buying. At the same time, we have the FPOs, we have other farmers collectives. The system is working as we have seen in the case of mission organic value chain development being implemented by agriculture department. But thing has to be facilitated at the local level. Uh, and I think uh, here, uh, this NERAMAC can play a very important role in this kind of facilitation with the states. And Honorable Minister also is very much uh, in favor of uh, encouraging the outside investors, the big players, mark, uh, buyers, to go and set up their skilling camps over there and facilitate the things. Third thing is about financial infrastructure. I think there is a tremendous requirement of working capital, credit guarantee scheme, and uh, production-linked incentives. Now we have even exploring the possibility of challenge fund and all. So I think uh, the normal banking channel, normal products that are available with the banks is not able to take care of the farmers uh, in this sector. So they require a specialized, customized uh, product for uh, rural credit. That uh, I request the prospective investors and banks, financial institution to put their hands together with, uh, we have a net fee also. Uh, we can find out a product suited to the farmers for uh, plantation as well as uh, processing infrastructure. Fourth area is logistics. We have cold storage. Most of them are in the private sector I have seen. But uh, these are not synchronized with the kind of production capabilities be because most of the cold chains, cold, cold storage in the Northeast are being used by stockists. People buying onion, potato, tomato, all these things, ginger from outside and uh, using these, uh, sto uh, these uh, cold storage as local storage before retailing it to the different rural markets. So I had this in mind that we require it for more for the farmers to aggregate and keep their things before sending it to the higher markets, but actually the opposite is happening. So this trend needs to be reversed. And for that, I think first a farmers, committed farmers base needs to be created who can be supported to create a critical mass of this produce so that the reverse flow can take place, start taking place. Yes, two, three more points very quickly. Th next is that uh, Krishi Udan had a problem of uh, uh, the airport local storage, so that also needs to be uh, done up. Uh, Northeastern cargo is there. I keep always telling that uh, out of every, roughly every 100 trucks that is reaching the Northeastern destination, 70 trucks is coming back empty, transporting just air and nothing else. So that capacity can be put to use by devising some innovative kind of mobile app through which these things can be coordinated. Then uh, export uh, processing, I think we have started a few, uh, doing a few uh, trainings for creating a manpower a resource base for uh, promoting this uh, ex export. But uh, things have got somewhere lost in the dreary desert, send off something, something, <laughs> and things are not happening. So this needs to be, I think, re-energized. Then uh, I'm sure investors can help there. Then uh, bamboo products, there is an issue of first mile connectivity. The bamboo plantation is there is not being able to brought to the processing center because of prohibitive cost of harvesting and transport. Then uh, innovative solutions can be uh, found out. And the last thing is about the capacity building. Uh, I think uh, the concept of uh, development fellows that Assam government has taken up very recently. Yesterday only I had a very detailed discussion with them. I think that is a very promising concept. So their uh, people can be uh, I mean, recruited and then trained specifically for facility acting as a link between the government departments and the farmer groups 
and uh, hand holding and accelerating the process of clusterization be because clusterization is the only thing that will um, make this entire operation viable in the northeastern region. We cannot uh, go to each and every farmer individually to provide them support and training and capacity building. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Day, and uh, I think you have also created a very nice segue into uh, what we are going to uh, ask Commodore Ashok from uh, Neramac to um, speak about, which is about this last point that you said about cluster or collectivization in agriculture, which is the way forward as, uh, uh, as uh, uh, Mr. Day has highlighted. So. Um, Commodore Ashok, you know, you this is this is a daily engagement area for you, looking at um, at at FPOs and looking at collectivization in agriculture. Um, so, if you can highlight some of the sort of opportunities first, and maybe challenges later, of how FPOs and collectivization in agriculture can be taken forward, and the 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 strength that you see, and from your very rich experience for the last few years working with the FPOs, what are some of the strengths that of the FPOs that can help them uh, to, to be key sort of harbingers of sustainable uh, and inclusive agriculture? And if you can highlight maybe some pointers on policy as well, that will be great. Yeah, if about six minutes, if that's okay. Yeah. All right, thanks. Thank you, Rajit. In the interest of time, I think I'll stick to the uh, keep my points brief and we can probably take it up in the Q&A subsequently in case there's any elaboration required. Uh, to start with, uh, opportunities and challenges of clusterization. As Anshumanji also brought out, I think clusterization is the only way to address uh, the issues, especially in Northeast where uh, there is extreme fragmentation with each generation also going, extreme fragmentation of land. So I think clusterization is the way ahead. Uh, and one thing uh, investors must remember when they come there is that though we look uh, at Northeast as a common, as a single block, but each state is very unique in the way they operate, in their cultural sensitivities, in their uh, uh, tribal uh, sensitivities. So when you, when you enter a particular state, you'll have to sensitize yourself or like Anshumanji again rightly brought out, engage with a local agency there so that you are that much more empowered and that much more knowledgeable when you uh, enter into a transaction with that uh, particular set of farmers. Uh, coming to opportunities that the FPOs uh, provide, some of them are very obvious. There's easy market access primarily because of, uh, you know, you have economies of scale, the very fact that you can get your produce together, similar crops, they can uh, harvest together and they can come in. So there's reduced cost on the side of the farmer. There's also reduced cost on the side of the buyer because he can move it all together. It becomes much easier. Also, there is knowledge sharing amongst the farmers because of various uh, different experiences. It's also easy to bring in different FPOs to, of different states maybe, cultivating the same or similar crops to have an exchange of views and ideas so they can uh, share their experiences and good practices can be exchanged. And this is where organizations like us play a role because when we find something good happening in a place, we try to match it with a similar practice that is being, a similar crop that is being grown in another state so that they can have a mix and match of views and improve upon their uh, cultivation methodologies, their, uh, the way they go about business, and all such uh, nuanced actions that an FPO does. With an FPO, there is also a possibility of diversification of crops because it, uh, we have seen that happening in the Northeast where uh, progressive FPOs, some of them have asked uh, farmers uh, who, are, who have got extra lands to probably try out a different crop in a particular section of their, uh, of their farmland or they can also get into say a secondary profession like uh, cultivation of mushrooms or something of that sort. So that also happens so they can uh, get additional income in that fashion. So collectivization has its uh, advantages and uh, the NGOs, the startups, the private sector can all come in here and uh, assist. As such in the 10,000 FPO structure, there is a organization called the cluster based business organization, which is a business uh, body and that helps come in in between the implementing agency and the farmers to uh, help this uh, clusterization and help promote the FPO uh, to reach its potential. 
there are uh, challenges of course uh, with every opportunities there are challenges as well one is the uh, geographical terrain itself especially if you go in a place like arunachal in the almost 4 to 5 months in the in the year you have difficulty in accessing those uh, fpos because they are first of all population is sparse they are widely spread out uh, there are uh, instances of uh, roads getting washed away there are instances of landslides and uh, access for people becomes difficult so in case you're working in those areas that has to be borne in mind uh, as a challenge that will come up to you uh, during the monsoon season uh, and uh, there is also limited uh, you know resources in terms of capital in terms of cap technology and in terms of expertise again like was brought out by my previous panelist there is a need to bring in that as part of the uh, flavor which the private sector can bring in because capacity building introduction of new technologies uh, there is, I, I find that the a majority of the farmers are very uh, open to it though initially they seem hesitant but once they get into it they're very open to the idea and they they're willing to embrace it but they have some amount of trust has to be built with them and then they can uh, they tend to accept what you bring in so that has to be kept in mind of course capacity building becomes much simpler uh, if you have a uh, if you have a collective uh, this thing uh, collectivization but that of course it has its like i mentioned initially there are customs traditions so those challenges do come in and they tend to play an initial part when you are trying to make headway with the fpo but as you gain their trust and you show that you're there to stay and not a fly by night person they tend to uh, open up to you and they tend to embrace what you're uh, exposing them to uh, coming to the specific uh, requirement the part to which uh, rijit mentioned of uh, how sustainable agriculture can be sustained by fpos a few pointers here the by virtue of collectivization itself the whole uh, whatever you do can be addressed to a larger section of the of the of the farmers immediately so that is one major thing that can be done as i mentioned uh, they can be encouraged for uh, as a secondary source of income they can be encouraged to get into vermicomposting mushroom or any such other water conservation methods any government policies can be told to them you know dispersed to them and disseminated to them in a much uh, simpler fashion fashion uh, also there has been a because of collectivization there has been a decreasing trend i won't say it's dying off but there's a decreasing trend of the jhum cultivation that is a slash and burn cultivation that used to happen and i find that there are a lot of farmers who are involved in it who are now part of the fpo in fact they say that they are taking up a particular crop because they want to get out of that uh, of that practice one because it's increasingly unacceptable to people around them and second they also feel that it is a better way and a more stable way to conduct farming when you get out of that so there are a lot of fpos that are uh, uh, looking at uh, getting out of the jhum cultivation practices so that again will help in uh, sustainable agriculture also like i mentioned you can have diverse crops so that also helps re regeneration of the soil uh, naturally so there is a reduction in the amount of uh, pesticides fertilizers that is being used also uh, mr sanjay is here from clover he is one of our cvbos he will uh, support me when i say that uh, bio fertilizers licensing is being done for the fpos now because there are a lot of uh, there was again as part of the 10000 fpo scheme there was a thrust from the ministry of agriculture for fertilizer and licenses to be obtained by fpos so that that's one channel of business for them uh, uh, however the uh, the option of bio fertilizers was also there and a large majority of states have opted for that and a large majority of farmers even though in some of the states chemical fertilizers are still being used they are still going in for bio fertilizers because they feel that's the way forward so that's again coming from them naturally and they have realized that with increased market exposure they have realized that there is potential for the northeastern produce to be uh, naturally grown and have a better remuneration there, there, thereby so they have adopt, they are adopting these practices on their own as well one minute so you also have renewable renewable energy uh, if you are looking at some processing unit being set up we have engagements with selco who convert the uh, the machinery into a solar uh, machinery and other other organizations also selco is just an example so so we have organizations like this that can engage with the uh, fpos again and having a unit of a larger scale at an fpo level is much more logical than having it at individual farmer level of course uh, by virtue of regulations itself in the scheme women are being empowered and as the secretary had mentioned there is a need to engage women and youth i think both of these uh, aspects are getting addressed by collectivization by collectivization and uh, this again is a step towards sustainable agriculture and also 
supporting people who are staying back in the Northeast to continue with their, uh, with their uh, older generation in engaging in uh, agriculture. I think uh, I'll stop here because we'll come back in case there's a Q&A. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rajiv, uh, for the, the, those um, points. I'll, I'll quickly switch over to a colleague from ECO. Um, Ale, Ale Bara is the executive director, our next panelist. Um, executive Director of ECO, Ale is, um, is, a tra is trained in, uh, in social work um, in, in TIS, um, a senior fellow at John Hopkins University, has been working on this whole responsible business agenda for the last, as long as I have known him, and has an experience of about 30 years and has been working in the Northeast. Um, that's one, uh, one, one thing which, you know, sort of, uh, is one of the v number of institutions which has been working in the Northeast. So th he brings in very <coughs> rich experience of, of, of the region. And, you know, uh, Ale, um, the work that you do, uh, especially engagement with the, with the women farmers, the women agro-entrepreneurs is, um, uh, is, is quite pioneering. And um, if, you can, if you can probably talk about some of the l learnings from that uh, from that engagement and also you know what the point that has been raised by um, the earlier speakers is very clear that there are a number of key opportunities f if the private sector or businesses um, are, are uh, want to engage in sustainable agriculture value chain in the region so if you can also highlight some of those key impact areas you know which um, businesses are always looking for and they have made um, across the uh, segment, a uh, number of businesses have made commitments to promote sustainable agriculture in the entire value chain. So how can we attract businesses by telling them, well, you know, here is an area where these are some impact areas, whether this is women, or, or, you know, empowerment, whether it is water, whether it is natural resources. So if you can, you know, sort of be the person trying to uh, sort of highlight that and maybe also a little bit about policy. So a lot to pack in about seven minutes, but I'm sure you will be able to do that. Ale, you have the floor. Okay. Thank you, Rijit. Uh, respected uh, Secretary, sir, from Donor, Joint Secretary, sir, uh, Commodore Rajiv, fellow panelists, and uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's my pleasure. I am actually, as he mentioned, I'm from Assam, born and brought up, and have been working there. As uh, earlier panelists and uh, sir al already pointed out the uniqueness of Northeast and I think opportunity exists. There is no doubt about it. And I'm sure Dipanita would look, uh, she was telling her that she would give a cultural perspective to the Northeast. So I'm not going to dwell upon that. First, uh, you know, we are currently uh, working with nearly 10,000 women farmers in Assam, Meghalaya, Sikkim, uh, and uh, Nagaland. And out of that, 6,000 are in Assam. So this, uh, out of 10,000, 6,000 are collectivized, meaning there are five pharma producer group or cooperative, and they are different subsector. For example, uh, we have sericulture, about 300 women working in BTR area, who have formed into a collective uh, producer group. Uh, we have 2,000 women turmeric farmers in Gualpara district. We have about 2,000 uh, aquaculture, very small and marginal women farmers in Morigaon district. And when I say very small and margin, sir, and uh, uh, sir Day was talking about aquaculture and fishery potential. The criteria was that those women who have only half a bigha of land and maximum one acre land are mobilized. As you said, we brought everybody who has a small pond at a home. And also 500 women uh, who are into handloom and textile in Morigaon district and 500 farmers in Karbi Anglong who are into ginger. So uh, when we see that, that yes, I think, uh, by the way, how many of you are from Northeast and how many of you are engaged in agriculture? Can you raise your hand, especially women, a man? Well, okay. You are, you are two questions. <laughs> you can ask one and then... <laughs> how many of you are engaged in agriculture? Okay. Sure. Uh, women 
Thank you. Thank you. Good. Okay. No, I could also see man raising hand. And I'm sorry, you know, many of you are engaged, but you have interest. That's why you are here. So, uh, first thing, in Northeast, women are very resilient. Uh, they are far, far more, you know, hardworking than men. I'm, I'm sorry for the man here, yeah, but that's the fact. So they, once they do something, they, they take it to the next level, and they have, uh, you know, also additional responsibilities. You know, they have to do cooking and sending school to their child and everything. I mean, there are a lot of activities. Despite that, I think last 10 years, sir, they have come forward. They have come forward. They have uh, set up self-help group, producer group, cluster level federations, and there is excellent example. Uh, right from a small village level group to a agri entrepreneur, as you also said, they're a very successful example. And uh, what we also experience is that when we kind of tr trying to work with these farmers and women farmers, they have collectivized, they have increased their production because we have also trained them on best practices. For example, I would take the example of aquaculture because that's very easy. You cannot imagine if you have a small pond of one bigger you need to put 1,000 fingerlings. And it would cost you 2 rupees a fingerling. And then if you take another you know, feed cost, I mean, most scientifically rearing and all that, it would cost you 30 to 40,000 investment in a span of nine months. And this, even if you take a survival rate of 80%, you have 8,000 kgs of rahu fish ready at 200 rupees per kilo, and your return is 1,60,000. So by investing 40,000, you are getting 1,20,000 profit. But the problem here is that why then it's not, not happening? And I think, uh, sir, you also mentioned the access to capital. They need finance. And uh, most of our schemes are also not tailored to women. They are very general. So I think we need to also have separate uh, scheme for women who would we should cater to their, their requirement because they, have, they are engaged in various things. They are training. If you call them for five days to a centralized place for training, it's sometimes very difficult leaving the house and you know, everything and coming back. So can we do something at their home, can nearby places, you know, things like that. Access to finance, they don't own land. They, don't, they can't give mortgage. So they are dependent on man. So if man says, you take and half of it, you have to give it to me, right? So that is how it happens. So I can see that because, you know, and as far as sustainable agriculture is concerned, I think women are already doing it because they know that they can get, you know, they have to, that also maintain their food security. Because if they produce, you know, good vegetable at home, some fish, you know, uh, some goat and everything, it's more integrated farming in our northeast and most of them do all the things. And, but beyond that, when they go to the market, commercially doing it, we found that they feel a lot of constraint access to capital, uh, then buying inputs. So if you tell them uh, that you buy fingerlings, they need 3,000 rupees cash, but it is not available with them. So, you know, they would say, dekha jayega. So, you know, we'll throw only 300 fingerlings, but that is not going to help them at all. So these are small things, but it makes a big difference as far as women uh, are concerned. Now there is a market expansion because there is, as I said, Sikkim has already become organic. Now I think Assam, Manipur, uh, and uh, Mizoram and other states are also trying to follow. So if we have more organic product, it would require market expansion. And that can happen right from local level to national level. We have been able to kind of get buyers. Uh, but as you said that, you know, there is no aggregation. There is no quality and standards. So uh, we need to take the market to the poor to the village, not, you know, looking market outside. What I mean by that, for example, we have recently uh, arranged a big buyer, a very big company who needs uh, 100 tons of turmeric. Then they negotiated the 2,000 women. They said, impossible. We, we can some talk about 10, 10, 10 tons. So now 10 tons, they said, now season is gone. Now next season will only come in February. But they said, I am falling short now. I need now. <laughs> So negotiation was done to half a ton. And the company informs me that last one month they are struggling to even get half a ton of turmeric. So this is also a reality. So what I'm just trying to say is that, you know, that they have to go to the fellow producer, they have to collect it, they have to grind it, they have to package it, and they have to taste it. 
So they don't know how to test it because there could be moisture, there could be other particles there. They want to know the curcumin content. So uh, those facilities are also not available. Now, uh, again, value addition potential, I think there is a lot and women are doing it. And uh, I'm, I'm sure, two minutes, yeah. And uh, I think uh, there is no doubt that government is doing a lot. In fact, I would say there's an over-dependency on government because government is doing so much. Now, oh, whenever you go to the village, they said government will come and do it for us because they have given us everything. Now, that's also we found that sometime problem. So, how do we kind of see that, uh, you know, that whatever they need and uh, farmers who are actually doing it, we need to kind of encourage them with access to finance, with access to technology. I was just thinking, you know, there is so many organizations for under Ministry of Donor, like Nectar was recently doing a training of a drone for women entrepreneurs, okay? So if we talk about women going to the field and, uh, you know, spending their time, and why can't they just send a drone to the field? The drone will take a picture and come back and give it to them. They are sitting at home. They, they can do the remote controlling. I'm, I'm, when we're talking about really technology, I think we should use such technology. We should reduce the drudgery on women. They have to save time and also ap appropriate application of technology. And that, that is what we need to do when we talk about technology. Technology doesn't mean only social media and going and selling, you know. And mostly we see that mostly people are doing uh, the video and trying to say that, you know, everything is your lakadang turmeric. <laughs> that, that, that's, that's become a joke now because and servers, we are having a chat that it can only grow in Jayantia Hills. You know, if you take it to other places, it is, it is not give, going to give you the same kind of curcumin and, uh, you know, other, other content there. So that is another part. And uh, I think uh, we also ran a program called Assam Agribusiness Growth Lab uh, for last three years with uh, World Bank funding uh, under a project called Apart. And there, 40% of the women were uh, agri entrepreneurs. And they have done wonderfully well. Again, when I am saying compared to men. So they have looked at millets, they have looked at uh, black rice, they have looked at very traditional products. So that those products are more sustainable in the future. And not only it's just commercial, but it also gives, you know, most of us are diabetic nowadays. So we all look for millets and, you know, what not. But we have to produce also, no? It, it was like earlier called poor man's food, the millet. But now, after Prime Minister has launched it, now it's become very hot cake. Everybody wants to do it. But what is it? So, uh, Rigit is already showing me, maybe in the next round. Thank you so much. And I think, you know, I can go on and go on because I work in the field. I am basically a practitioner. Uh, but maybe in the question round session, I can answer you more. Thank you. Yeah, my apologies, Alay. I was just conscious of the time. Um, so thank you so much. Uh, you know the the the, the we've we've heard uh, you know uh, the uh, the practitioners and the experts from let us say the the supply side. Um, we would now switch over to the the demand side, um, which is the uh, the large company, uh, and we're very delighted to have uh, the Panita Chakravarti, the regional director for corporate responsibility and sustainable development from Kargil. Asia Pacific, and she has been with Cargill for a very long time. Um, she has also been working on sustainable agriculture, responsible business, and CSR um, for a for a long lo for a long time. Um, you know, um, ha has been honored by several awards in the, in in, um, in in areas whether it is on um, women leadership, whether it is in terms of sustainability champion. And has um, and is, is is the other relevant thing is that she's she's born and brought up in Arunachal, so she is not a, a, a you know a, 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 um, a, an outsider, a stranger to the to the region. So, uh, Dipanita, you have the floor. If um, you know what what I what we would like to hear from you is you know you've heard about the. Well, you heard the challenges, but you've also heard about the the opportunities. And uh, you know, so when it comes to the private sector, in any uh, and it is very clear that there are several areas that the private sector can engage. Whether it is supply chain, whether it is procurement, whether it is technology, whether it is maybe even CSR. So, as not just as Cargill, but as a 
you know, as a very senior expert in sustainable agriculture, you've been working in this area. Based on what you've heard so far, what do you think are the ways in which, um, you know, small whole, you know, large companies like yours can and are actually engaging with the smallholders and the collectives? If you can maybe focus on that. And, and what do you feel uh, are some of the enabling factors, whether they're, you know, pertaining to policy or, or other uh, enabling factors that can help bring the private sector and investors closer to the northeastern region, specifically in, in agriculture. You have the floor. It's about six minutes, if that's okay. Thanks, Rajit. And good morning, everybody. And a really privileged to be here. Um, like Rajit mentioned, I do have the privilege of being born to parents who decided to reverse migrate to Arunachal Pradesh back in the early 80s um, to work for the forest department. So I do have the privilege of being born and raised in, in a state um, in the Northeast, surrounded by mountains and forests. And uh, it's, it's a funny story that I think I, sh I should share. One of my parents' colleagues, um, he got married and uh, his uh, wife was from this part of the world. And um, it, it was advised not to travel a little late in the evening there because one could encounter wild animals and the uh, the bride the new newly married couple were driving to to this place called Deomali at that point in time we were um, living there and uh, the the gentleman told his bride that there might be an instance where you might encounter a wild animal or two you know, people who live in other parts of the country, they don't realize what it really entails, right? And then suddenly, um, the car has to be stopped because there are a set of twinkling eyes on, on the road and the bride faints because there was a panther crossing the road. And um, thankfully, they're still married. Um, they have, <laughs> the, the, the wife persevered. Um, so there's just a little, way that we lived, we, we were very used to having elephants come and break the walls of our uh, houses and, and we had to shut all the lights and, uh, you know, be inside and be quiet and, um, and, and you know, it, it's, it's, it's so interesting, we're talking about 65% um, for forest land in the northeastern part of the country. And we used to see sugarcane growing just all over the place. It was not even, you know, a, a thing, sugarcane, maize, all of these things were just growing. Um, and, and I also had this experience of going to school when there was landslide happening. So the way we used to go to school was, so at that point in time, uh, we were living in this place called Bandardua. So there, there was only primary school education available. So to go to that, and I'm a KV school product that way. So we had to go, the school bus would take us from one side to, to one side because then we had to go to Naharlagan for the rest of our school. And then there used to be landslide happening. The army used to really take us, kids, and walk with us to the other side of the road, which was about two to three kilometers, and then board another bus to go to school. And our parents used to pray back at home that we would come back home alive. And, and that's, I mean, the reason I wanted to just bring this up also is because this talks about resilience. And I, I feel personally, today, if I have some amount of resilience in me and understanding and adaptability, a lot of it has also uh, been developed by what I experienced um, as a child living in that part of the world. Um, and, and uh, you know, I, I think one of the things that I, my, my takeaway from the conversations that just happened today in the room as we talk about sustainable agriculture, as we talk about creating an ecosystem which is conducive for people of that part of the world who are beautiful, who, again, have a lot of resilience, who have eagerness to learn. I have a lot of friends from that part of the world because I grew up, grew up there. I think it is important to meet the people where they are. I think that is a point sometimes that oftentimes gets missed as we deliberate sitting in, 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 a, in a place without really understanding the, the realities that exist in a particular part of the world. So uh, as Kamadur Ashok talked about it, as Alay talked about it, from the ground, uh, the realities that exist, you know, be it with women, be it with 
several farmers. I think, um, you know, one of the intrinsic things that I very strongly felt and, and have felt in working with across various parts of the country, but also uh, various parts of Asia Pacific because of the remit of my current uh, work that I do, is it's extremely important as it relates to farming because they are really producing for what we put on the table for, for each one of us to eat, is to really understand where they are coming from, what is their ecosystem, what do they need, uh, and then kind of try and customize and tailor made the solutions. Um, and I've, to, 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 to me, that is where collaboration comes in, that is where dialogue comes in, that is where knowledge sharing comes in. I can share a couple of quick examples. So we, um, as Cargill, we work um, in Urissa uh, with over 30,000 women smallholder farmers. And the, the, the value chain that we work there is poultry and backyard poultry. Okay, I think anybody who's been in, in the Northeast will, will you know, very easily resonate that backyard poultry is something that is just you know, happening at the backyard without even realizing that it's happening. It's just such a done thing. Um, but the moment we can go and meet these pe you know, people and try and create, again, an ecosystem, help them with you know, um, knowledge sharing, best practices, where they can actually rear more birds where the flock size of their birds can increase and actually become an economically viable option. That, and, and then, like I said, these this 30,000 women smallholders are all women who are predominantly taking charge. So two things. One is obviously it gives major time agency to the women for the decision making that they do because they have an economic power at, at their home. So what their children eat, what they eat, the nutrition um, decision making in the, in the families really go through a massive change. The, um, the decision making that they do for educating their children, because then they have the agency, that also makes a massive, massive change. Um, and then they, the, the word of mouth. They say women talk, yes we do, right? <laughs> and when the, the word of mouth really makes that, that, that 30,000 to double up in, in, in a pretty easy way, without us having to intervene a lot. Because then, if they see the viability, if they see that it is an economically uh, sound aspect that they are able to generate income over a period of time, which has been proven now for, uh, for the last five to six years that we've been engaged in Orissa, it is now they who are propagating it. They have now developed their own self-help groups, FPO, and they are on the board of the FPO. So be, like, they are really taking the ownership and the leadership to move it along. And they have come to Delhi a couple of times to also uh, you know, be in dioceses like this and, and share their own stories. So I just wanted to share like a quick example of how that could happen. There is a lot of back and work that needs to go into it. And I, but I think the most important element is the intent. I, I, I have personally felt when we go with that intent, and, and I also uh, am responsible for grant making and philanthropy grant from the organization that I belong to. So you know, while we do that in a pre-competitive, pre-commercial way, that also creates an opportunity for business as usual to take place once we take the grant funding out and it becomes an ownership of the people who are actually engaged in it. Um, so we have seen those examples happening, and I'm very happy to share it offline, you know, if anybody is interested. Um, and the second one, I, I'll just take one minute, Rajit, is also to, to mention that um, the climate situation today, none, none of us is immune to it. Like, like I said, when I was growing up in Arunachal Pradesh, landslides, floods, rains, uh, you know, they, they were just commonplace. But now we are now seeing it here as well, and we live in an interconnected world. And when we talk about food system, food system and when we talk about food security, and when we talk about uh, you know, having to feed a, a population which is large, we cannot not take into account the impact and the influence of climate on how food is grown, how it is produced, and how it is processed, and how it is taken to the market, and how we put it on the table. I think that's a very, very critical consideration for all of us in the room that you know, we, we have a lot of knowledge, we have 
policies that needs to think about it. There are regenerative practices. We do such pro programs in, in some states. I'm again very happy to share some of the examples. But I think it is very important for all of us to have that intent to, to do it. And I also feel very confident having also had the privilege and the opportunity to be on the field a lot, really working with the farmers and the farming households and talking to them, understanding, listening to them, that they really want to do the right thing for their families, but it has to have that everything that, that we also talk about, right? What's in it for me? I think the moment we are able to answer that question in a very intentional way, um, it takes off. So I'm, I'm just going to end it on that this uh, very optimistic note. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dipanita. I think you know your observations were spot on, and uh, we'll probably come back to the panel once more with uh, one more round if time permits. But let me also take this opportunity to open up the floor and take maybe some questions. If uh, I can have uh, some microphones, I don't know, Nitya, if, are there? Is there anybody who can help with the microphones? Yeah. Please uh, introduce yourself. Uh, there's a hand there at the back, Sumit. Please introduce yourself and uh, and and ask a question if that's okay. So my name is Sumit, and I work uh, with an institution which is called Worldwide Fund for Nature. And I look after the sustainable agriculture of uh, the Worldwide Fund for Nature. Uh, so I think there's a very good discussion that happened. And uh, uh, I, I congratulate the panelists as well as uh, you know the convener. Uh, I think this kind of discussions is required uh, very frequently, because as uh, Dipanita mentioned that you know we need to know, we need to go to and see what, what is there in the Northeast. Uh, People in the Delhi or people sitting in the plain land may not be able to understand what actually, you know, uh, uh, the cultural and the uh, uh, ecological aspects of Northwest is. Uh, I just came from yesterday from Karbi Anglang and was trying to understand evaluation assessment, you know, commodity evaluation assessment. Such a huge potential. You, 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 you name it, I mean, you have like, you know, uh, from broom grass to ginger to turmeric to whatnot, I mean, bamboo and everything, and it's grown organically. Northeast. Uh, you know, uh, millets to, you know, uh, pulses, whatever you, grow, I mean, you see it's growing. I mean, it's, uh, it's growing, uh, it, processing is also happening in a very environmentally, you know, uh, sound manner. I mean, people are not using chemicals. Uh, uh, the processing is also happening with, you know, use of uh, windmills. I mean, uh, oh, sorry, use of uh, water mills and all. So you have the, uh, I mean, I mean, the ecosystem is actually providing the inputs. You don't require chemical fertilizer, you don't require energy. So you know, yeah, I'm coming to the question. So the thing is that you know, when when we when we're talking about framing a uh, policy and that took for a sustainable agriculture, I think the integration of both this uh, ecology as well as the enterprising development should go hand in hand. I mean, it may not like you know, for example, policies which is applicable for a plain land like you know uh, Punjab or or say for Madhya Pradesh, uh, we need to think a little different way, keeping the aspects of both the ecology as well as the cultural context in place. So my question to Mr. I mean, particularly to Mr. Anshuman or uh, Mr. Ashok is, how we see this in the policy framing, taking both the consideration of uh, the ecosystem aspects as well as the cultural aspects of the state? Maybe we'll take one or two more questions and then we'll come back to the, yeah, the lady at the back and the gentleman, and after that, the gentleman here, thanks. Please introduce yourself and then the question, please be precise, thanks. Do that. Hello, I am Priyam Vada. I have come here as an individual basis after 24 years of IT experience. Yesterday I visited the stalls from Northeast and it was really a pleasure to see something which none of us know. So it was state-wise and, uh, and uh, overall I come to know that what they are trying to, uh, I mean how they are trying to take their products to the larger of Bharat, their website and how they are trying to export it. But uh, what I wish to know really that what do we have any efforts uh, be taken uh, being towards having captured the seeds? Are we storing the seeds database? Because when I saw the millets over there, I forgot the names. They said that we the farmers have such a less crops that they cannot even provide them within their states. Forget about exporting them. And since we know the millets and their properties, and those two were key millets. And so when I was in US, they were having questions that how we can obtain it from India. 
So the Northeast states being recognized for that was really good. Then uh, that is something I wish to you know yeah. put across the forum. Secondly, I forgot to count your mention for the farmers, but yesterday I attended one of the sessions on sustainability uh, and, uh, and resiliency, wherein they were mentioning that throughout the India, it is very difficult to approach each farmer. So it will happen word to mouth that I agree, it will require more manpower. But when you strongly gave us the number of North East States, have you done something specific which we can roll out to the entire of India? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Do yeah. you? Maybe I'm uh, There's one more gentleman here who had raised his hands. And, and uh, one question, if possible, please. Uh, my name is Francis Silo. I'm having a stall there at the winery section from Northeastern uh, State. So my question goes to the Ministry of Donor or NEC. So as you see, the wine industry is at a very nascent stage in the northeastern India. So Mizoram and uh, Meghalaya is having a good start, whereas Arunachal and Meskima are doing well. But uh, uh, Meghal sorry, uh, Nagaland and Manipur they have the state policy, so it yet to you know at a, at a certain stage. So my question is, uh, can the Ministry of Donor have a specific package for the fledging wine industry in the northeastern region? Uh, in terms of maybe the horticulture, uh, like the viticulture, horticulture, and the processing unit. So I'm also representing the All India Wine Producer Association for the Northeast region. So uh, if somebody can take that up, so we would be very grateful. Sure. I'll turn over to the panelists. Um, there are three questions. If anybody would like to respond to, yeah. feel free. Yeah. I'd like to respond to... Uh, yeah, first Sumit's uh, question, uh, very good question. Uh, you talked about uh, how to balance the ecological considerations and the development process, whether we have any such kind of mechanism to uh, weigh the pr uh, candidate projects as per this. That Yes, we do have. We, in the, in the appraisal process, whether it is done at the Government of India level, at a larger scale decision to be taken by the cabinet or at the lowest level, uh, maybe a couple of crore projects to be sanctioned by NEC. We have uh, a project for uh, the format for concept known DPR and also appraisal in which environmental consideration is definitely a part of the process. We assess all the pr uh, projects that come to us uh, in, from the economic consideration whether it, it is making any sense, the kind of uh, benefits that we are expecting, looking at commensurate with what kind of investment uh, cost to the society. Uh, we are forget about the cost to the government, to the grant, granting part. So yes, we do that. There is a mechanism. Coming to the number two, um, Piyambada's question, uh, what we have done in the Northeast, which can be uh, rolled out at the national level. Uh, specific uh, one very noble initiative that we have taken, we have tried to bring the growers, the buyers, and the service providers in a single platform. Very recently, we have started in a small way in the form of a Northeast Agri Commodity E-Exchange. We call it any race, neres.in is the portal where any farmer of the Northeast can register himself through a simple mobile number and OTP in that portal, the, the backend, uh, some kind of KYC is done. And buyers also can uh, register and log in. And then they do a kind of matchmaking, something like shadi.com and or some, something of that sort. <laughs> so once this is matched, then it is uh, between the persuasion follow-up between buyers. We don't enter into exactly uh, financial transaction and all. Maybe at present we are not equipped to do that future also we can consider. And once the deal is final, uh, then uh, we have the service providers who can provide us the service. There is a provision for service providers also to register and participate in the portal. Uh, now, the coming um, to the relevant, relevant question of uh, uh, not having enough surplus to go for uh, large-scale buyer uh, to meet the requirement of large-scale buyer from outside, a specific example was given of uh, cardamom, sorry, la cardamom turmeric, I think it was given. It's a chicken and egg problem, you see. We don't have enough surplus, marketable surplus, so buyers are not coming. 
And just because buyers are not coming, we, the farmers is not encouraged to buy, generate enough surplus, produce, uh, put more uh, hectares into the crop, uh, under the crop. So it has to be pulled both ways. I think there has to be assurance, some kind of reasonable assurance, greater than what it is at, uh, today, that yes, you produce, we'll make sure that it's bought, it's sold to somebody. So the light slightly incremental, 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 then over a period of time, it will settle down at a higher level than what is happening, volume is happening today. So I think partly the, that uh, addresses your question. And uh, the coming to Francis' question of uh, uh, oil industry, I think you talk about oil industry. Wine. Wine, Wine. sorry, I got it wrong, <laughs> actually. <laughs> That's a very good idea. In fact, uh, from last 10 years, I have been thinking about this. There's somebody who should raise this question. Pineapple wine, I think some people have tried, one makers have tried it. It is one of the best wines. And kiwi wines also. I think Arunachal is already, you must have experienced it. <laughs> yes. Yes, some entrepreneurs who interacted the other day, they are one lady. Yeah. I not think yet. not. I am not. I am not the competent person to answer. But it is not in my knowledge whether any serious attempt has been made to formulate the policy. But if the state government suggests, I think we can definitely take it up with the relevant departments. Yes. Yeah. Just, just like, to, uh, just to add to that uh, policy framework question which Sunil was asking, uh, there is definite uh, consideration for the northeast given whenever the central government policies are made. And uh, they get rooted not only through Ministry of Donor, but also sometimes to us for comments. And we add our comments to that to suit our requirements in the Northeast. I'll give you an example. Ministry of Agriculture, the number of farmers required to uh, you know, uh, create a cluster in the rest of India is very different from what has been designated for Northeast. Similarly, there are a number of tweaks that are given to this. There are also mid-course corrections to a policy that are taken up. And uh, very soon, they're going to launch uh, the uh, revival of the cooperatives of fisheries as well. There again, our comments were sought and we gave, you know, because Northeast has different nuances are there. So we gave our comments on that and they're definitely factored. So that part is being addressed, uh, well, I think, loud and clear. I think the lady asked about uh, seeds. Uh, the foxtail and barnyard is what is, and job steer is what has come up in the northeast as far as millets are concerned. The National Seed Corporation gives us seeds to the farmers. The farmers themselves, once they harvest, they keep back some seeds. But if they are unable to do that, then the National Seed Corporation gives out seeds to them. And uh, we also conduct, uh, you know, millet has got a lot of focus in the last few years since 2018. And we ourselves are conduct awareness campaigns and assistances are provided when they seek something uh, from us. So that part is also looked after. Yeah, thanks. Uh, um, thanks, Komodo Ashok. Thanks, uh, uh, thanks all the panelists. I think we've we've run out of time and we are getting um, uh, eyed at by the organizers. So we'll have to uh, bring this to a closure. But maybe I'll use my uh, you know one minute uh, sort of veto as the as the uh, as a moderator to try and sum up or well not sum up highlight some of the things as we promised. We'll come up with some sort of an uh, action agenda. So, um, you know, we started with the discussion that the stage is really set. There, everything is going for the Northeast in terms of the, the demography, in terms of the education, in terms of the natural resources, in terms of the linkage with agriculture and livelihood. So the stage is really set. The second, the, the, so therefore, how do we enable uh, perhaps better you know, engagement with the market. And it is very clear that there are five specific areas where the private sector or, or, or the business really can drive such sustainable and inclusive agriculture. This is nothing new. So we're not saying anything new. It is all known. We are just trying to highlight it. So the five areas based on what, uh, you know, we've heard the, the panelists speak uh, as far as um, uh, private sector or business engagement on sustainable agriculture. One is procurement, the usual, you know, buying from whatever is available, as uh, you know, uh, as was highlighted by the panelists. Second is investment. You know, are there enough investment in agriculture which is happening, and what are those areas that could be invested, highlighted, 
by uh, Secretary Sir, uh, Commodore Ashok and others where uh, p points were already highlighted, whether it is storage infrastructure, post-harvesting, so on and so forth. Um, appropriate technology, uh, Anshumande spoke about it, that technology should be more appropriate and there are possibilities of doing uh, appropriate technology, grassroots technology, you know, and technology does not have to be fancy, high-end technology. It can also be grassroots, and um, and 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 also in addition to that, maybe uh, IT, because you know, digital infrastructure, the way the government of India is driving it, it also offers great opportunity for uh, innovation and uh, and application of technology. Uh, and of course, finally, is finance. You know, are there financial products which are available? Are financial institutions, non-banking financial institutions, engaging with this region? And on the on these five areas, there are definitely two areas. Uh, oh, there's a fifth area also, of course, which is CSR. Um, we do not have, and as Secretary Sir was saying, if you look at the volume of CSR, the amount, uh, the, um, the the volume of CSR that comes into this region is very, very uh, limited. And, 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 and there should be an effort to bring some of the points that we've heard today from you know, all of the pe uh, people from the Northeast and the institutions which work there and the, 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 in the companies which are interested in tho those areas and have experience of doing CSR project and facilitate sort of a, a collaborative idea and a, and a go-to place to drive CSR. So, um, so these are the five points which have emerged from the discussion, and uh, and we will we will create a, 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 a report out of this, and we will share with all of you and all the others who were invited, and we would seek your inputs on this and take this forward. So th at, um, so maybe at the end I'd like to um, turn over to Commodore Ashok for the final words. Yeah. That's fine. Okay. Thank you so much for. Uh, for your time and your attention and your active engagement. Um, uh, let us give it for the panelists, uh, give, give them a hand for their contribution. Uh, one, one, one round of hand for yourselves for being such a wonderful audience on Saturday morning. And we take also this opportunity to quickly felicitate the panelists. So maybe I'll request uh, Komodra Ashok to kindly felicitate uh, Sri Angshuman Day to start with. Um, the, to Dipanita Chakravarti. And uh, also Ale, Mr. Alebara. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Commander Ashok, and thank you to uh, all of you. Just last gift for to Richard. Oh.